um, Deputy Director of um, Energie Sparverband in Upper Austria. Um, and Christiana will talk to us about progress in energy efficiency policies in EU member states, the expert's perspective. Christiana, the floor is yours. A very good morning to you. Uh, I'm happy to be joining this webinar organized by Federen. So uh, what I will share with you uh, in the next 20 minutes are the key results of the Energy Efficiency Watch project uh, that Catherine already introduced uh, and our key findings in this project. So I'll, without any further ado, I will start. So what is the watch? It is a project funded by the European Commission, the Intelligent Energy for Europe program, and it focuses on the progress of energy efficiency policies and their implementation in the EU member states. What are we doing? We are analyzing and reporting. So this is uh, a part of that, what I will describe to you right now. We network and we communicate, spreading the message. So for example, this webinar is one example. We do this to anyone who has a stake in developing better energy efficiency policies in Europe. So parliamentarians, administrations, businesses, researchers, on regional, national, and EU levels. As uh, was already outlined, this is a process that has been going on since 26, uh, and we are now uh, coming to the end of this third Energy Efficiency Watch project. The key issue is always, how can we speed up energy efficiency policies in Europe? Uh, here, just a, a short slide on introducing the partners. The, the watch is coordinated by EU Forest, a network of EU uh, parliamentarians interested and committed to sustainable energy. Then we have three experts, uh, organizations, Ecofis, Wuppertal, and ourselves, and our three European networks, one of them, Pederen, uh, being the organizer of this webinar today. Uh, here's just a glimpse of the timetable uh, to remind us uh, on the progress of uh, the different EU policies. So we accompanied the ESD, the EED, and now we will uh, provide some input in uh, the new policy uh, framework, which we'll discuss later, uh, which was introduced with the so-called winter package. Now, um, uh, just to remind you, uh, the analysis, there's lots of very interesting information available. There are 28 country reports on all the EU uh, countries, 10 case studies on effective energy efficiency policies. There was a stakeholder consultation and there was a stakeholder survey on which I will report uh, to you now. So the survey, what was the objective of the survey? As many of you will know, there is a regular process of member state reporting to uh, the European Commission and the European institutions on how they see their progress in implementing the various energy efficiency policies. Now, we wanted to complement this by the view uh, from experts, from the people who are out there trying to uh, progress in energy efficiency and how they see the real-life progress in the policies in their respective countries. So in overall terms, uh, to this survey, 1,100 experts from 28 member states contributed to this survey. So this is a very good uh, result in terms of um, activating many experts all over Europe. And it's something that was done in 2015. We did questionnaires and oral interviews. There was a quantitative survey uh, with these 1,100 questionnaires plus a qualitative survey digging deeper into specific issues with all interviews carried out by the pre-network with three experts per member state. Now here um, you can see the participation of the different EU countries, so how the 11, roughly 1,100 um, responses split by member states. So clearly, uh, you can see uh, there are larger countries clearly have more energy efficiency experts. Uh, also, um, in some countries, um, there are more people willing to uh, complete an English questionnaire. Uh, and also, depending on how good our networks in the different member states were to activate 
uh, experts. But I think in, in the member states we have seen a sufficient number of experts contributing uh, to give at least a snapshot picture uh, of what was going on. Now, who completed this questionnaire? We have a very nice uh, split of roughly a third. People came from the business sector, so people working in companies uh, uh, being in that are involved in energy efficiency, researchers, uh, and in, in dark and light green, the public sector and the energy agencies in Europe uh, who are committed also to uh, making progress in energy efficiency and renewables. What is important if we have a survey is uh, to stress that these are perceptions of experts on the relative progress in energy efficiency policies in their own country. So we are not reporting on absolute levels of energy efficiency because that's done in the official reports. And it's not what other people think about other countries, uh, but it's about the opinion of the experts from this country about what is going on in their own country. That is uh, important to stress when you see the next pictures. So one result of the survey uh, are these pictures from member states where you can see, this is an example uh, from Luxembourg uh, where we depict in our pictures on the one hand the overall ambition uh, and on the other hand the progress in the last three years. I'll give you a picture later uh, of uh, uh, more EU countries, but so um, this helps us guide a little bit the discussion, so a lot of green is usually a positive feedback and a lot of orange and red uh, is uh, not so positive. So uh, we had a number of questions that were uh, looking at progress and out of these uh, questions we calculated a ranking uh, of progress. <clears throat> so what you can see here on this slide is a ranking by member states uh, on the overall progress uh, in, uh, since 2011 in these respective countries. And this is, of course, relative progress. So it's clearly in a country that has not yet a long tradition in energy efficiency. Um, some new policies may be already seen as good progress, when other countries with a well-developed uh, policy framework, um, the same additional policy may be seen as not so uh, a good development. So what we can see here very clearly is that in the Nordic countries um, the experts have a very positive perception uh, of the progress and on the other end uh, you can see some countries where the experts were very unhappy uh, what has happened in their countries in the couple of past years. The main reasons uh, if you look closer into these countries like Spain or the UK uh, is on the one hand uh, the impact of austerity policy which led to the fact that in the uh, period that we were uh, looking at many of the programs that existed before were cut and reduced and also uh, what you can see often in the, in the survey is an, an impact of um, elections. So if a new government is coming in uh, that uh, changes existing the existing policy framework, then uh, this can also have an impact on uh, the progress, obviously. What is very interesting, I think, is that we did a similar survey already three years before. And here you can see the comparison to the 2012 ranking. And uh, what is very evident here is uh, even the lead countries remain more or less the same. On the other hand, we have quite a lot of up and down movements. So countries that have gone significantly up in the progress due to new policies, new program, uh, and new um, dynamics in their energy efficiency policies, but we also see some countries with significant slowing down or disappearance of progress uh, compared to the years before. 
So these up and down movements are a very one of the uh, I think strongest results of this survey, and I think uh, opens a lot of room for debate. What can we do against these up and down movements? So I will show you now some selected results. Uh, this is was the question about the overall ambitions of energy efficiency policies in your country. And I think it's very clear, just looking at the colors, that there are some countries where the main impression is overall green, and there are the others with an impression of overall red and orange. So uh, the, 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 the disparity and the divergence of um, the result is quite significant among countries, so there's no clear one trend, but there, it really depends on uh, the specific countries. Um, similarly, uh, if we look at the answers on the progress, so these are the 28 member states we looked at, and clearly you can see how the colors change from country to country. Uh, so between countries where green dominates, so where there's an overall perception of a positive development, and red and orange where uh, the experts were not very happy with what happened um, in the years before. So uh, one question uh, related to the energy savings target. Uh, so, um, the, as you may know, the Energy Efficiency Directive requests uh, member states, or member states have committed themselves to achieve new energy savings every year of 1.5% uh, of the energy sales uh, to final consumers. So, uh, at that time, uh, this is roughly two years ago, uh, still, in many member states, the debate hadn't quite started, so we have quite a lot of gray. So, uh, if we did this today, I think that would be uh, even, uh, there would be uh, other colors being more dominant. But again, we can see a number of countries where uh, the answer is more negative, and, but also some that is half-half and some where it's more positive. Second key issue uh, in energy efficiency policies in the last years was uh, the, uh, the commitment of the member states that all new buildings must be nearly zero energy buildings by 2020. So the question to the experts was, do you see your country being on track towards this development? Because this is not something that will come into place uh, with one big bang uh, at the end of 2020, but um, the implementation is supposed to be step by step wise. And again, we can see countries that are doing this better, where more progress is seen, whereas others, where we, you get the impression if you look at the answers, the process has not uh, started at all. Um, also, this differs quite significantly um, between member states. So there are some member states that where the 1.5 savings target is seen to be progressing very well uh, with the orange line, whereas other countries, the, the NCEP, the nearly zero uh, buildings uh, obligation, is much better on track. So it seems that um, some member states focus more on the one and others focus more on the other. Unfortunately, not so many member states performed very well uh, on both of these targets and obligations. Um, in overall terms, uh, we asked several questions on the effectiveness of policy instruments in the different member states. Uh, what is very, very clear here is that uh, the experts, uh, the 1,100 experts re responding to our survey, uh, see legislative uh, instruments as the most effective in their countries, uh, especially requirements for buildings um, and uh, energy labeling. So, uh, for example, energy efficiency requirements for new buildings 
Uh, in 26 of the 28 member states, 70% of the experts say this is at least partly or very effective, uh, whereas only 30% uh, in one, uh, whereas um, only uh, in one of them, uh, over 30 see that as not effective. So this is an indicator that um, legislative policies, uh, also those that have been in place longer, uh, are perceived to be a lot more effective. On the low end uh, of this chart, you see, for example, smart metering. Only in two member states, uh, over 70% of the experts think uh, this is partly or very effective, whereas uh, in, in 17 countries, more than 30, say this is not effective at all. So the strongest uh, negative response uh, you can have. Uh, also, before coming to the conclusions, uh, we asked which policies should be introduced on EU level. And um, again, uh, these were the four um, where you can see uh, financial instruments, a European funds was seen as very important. And again, legislative instruments, stricter standards, uh, for buildings and appliances, as well as mandatory implementation of cost-effective measures in the industry. Now coming to the key conclusions of the WATCH project. So in overall terms, uh, what we can see is that national, regional, and local governments have shown that they can develop and implement effective policy instruments and contribute uh, to the targets. There is no one-fits-all approach. Uh, that is also very evident if you look at the results, but a large variety of instruments adjusted to the respective con context, and there's a wealth of experience and a rich source of mutual learning, uh, making the energy efficiency policy toolbox even stronger. So uh, now, after these years, we can see that Many member states have done uh, good and effective policies and uh, that others have profited also from their experience. However, uh, and that's the big however, there is an enormous disparity among member states in terms of the level of ambition and the progress. You saw my pictures with lots of green but also lots of red colors. And there are the ups and downs of the policy progress. So uh, depending on uh, short-term specific influence, but what all experts agree was that, uh, especially in those countries where um, there was a change in the policy framework to the worse, they are so glad that they have EU policy because that ensures at least a minimum of progress. So one of the conclusions we draw and we invite all the energy efficiency community out there is that we need a positive narrative for energy efficiency. So um, if we look at those countries who have an ambitious longer and uh, longer term policy because they have found an answer that works for them, why should we want energy efficiency? So that works for their respective country. This is, in some countries, there's a focus on climate change concerns. In other, they see the economic development opportunities. In other, they see it mainly as an instrument to defend the competitiveness of their industry. Those countries that have not been able to implement ambitious longer term energy efficiency, uh, policies are those that do it because Brussels tells us to do so. Uh, that's how it is phrased. Clearly, the commitment to the energy efficiency target is made by the member states themselves. But this is often what is said in national narrative. Yeah, we do this, but actually we just do it because we have to do. So uh, where energy efficiency policy work is uh, in places, in countries, in regions, a, where a consensus has been reached why this is a reasonable thing for them to do.
Ciao. Um, what is the element of an, a national or regional narrative can vary quite strongly. So it can be uh, cost savings, it can be energy security, it can be innovation, it can be uh, fuel poverty, it could be health benefits, etc. But I invite each of you after this short webinar to give a bit of thought what kind of narrative, uh, what kind of arguments works best in your countries. Uh, and that would help to convince a longer term to commitment towards energy efficiency than just this short term because Brussels tells us we have to do. Clearly, we also need new business models for energy efficiency. Uh, also, this is a key factor in progress. Uh, if there's not the right framework, it is hard to make energy efficiency the main business of a company. So this results in markets where energy efficiency policies are not systematically addressed. Uh, but it's just the case-by-case -case prog progress because there's a program, all companies go in one direction and look for one very specific product and services. However, uh, some examples, Denmark, Italy, are one of them where we can see a positive uh, development with the right policy framework uh, with companies where energy efficiency is their main business. And I think this was also a key element of the debate of the winter package, how can we better make this business case uh, for energy efficiency measure. So um, uh, with my final slide, um, I would like to conclude. Um, what we need is this credible narrative, these very good reasons why energy efficiency works in a specific region, in a specific country. We need market conditions for energy efficiency businesses. And um, then more important than the type of the policy that is chosen is its reliability in terms of long-term transparency and reasonable transaction costs. So if we can get these right with the winter package, um, I think we can go a step further in our claim to make Europe and its countries and regions a global leader in energy efficiency markets and technologies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christiana. Um, some very important messages there, um, particularly um, energy efficiency policies, importance that it matters, that needs to be reliable long-term policy, and that we need a positive narrative that could be different in each country um, to make it truly effective. Um, I'd just like to remind you uh, at the end of that a very good presentation um, of the publications from Energy Efficiency Watch, um, that we have the uh, key policy conclusions, the country reports, um, the European policy and business conclusions, and the expert survey report. So do please go on to the Energy Efficiency Watch website and, and look at these different publications, um, and we'd be glad to, to get more feedback from you. Okay. Um, so I'd now like to go on to our, introduce our next speaker. And we're very pleased to have Mr. Reisperman from the Committee of the Regions now. Um, Mr. Reisperman, the, the floor is yours. Yeah, am I, my microphone's on, I guess? Yes, thank you. And uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Egger, for this uh, good presentation on, uh, well, so to speak, the state of play and energy efficiency across uh, the European Union. Uh, I think we can see that we have a, a lot of progress made already. Uh, and, uh, I was quite surprised to see that uh, in the, the, the total ranking of countries, my own country was uh, scored in the 19th place, whereas if you look at the official numbers, uh, we're somewhere, I think, 27 or 26. So we're just uh, just above the bottom line. So it's uh, it's good to see that our uh, 
experts in my country are actually quite more optimistic about what was happening in the Netherlands than um, I think the official numbers uh, uh, say. Uh, I'm a rapporteur on the, the, the part of the winter package uh, on the energy uh, efficiency directive and the uh, energy uh, uh, for, uh, in buildings and uh, uh, I think it's very good to see what uh, the European uh, Commission is trying to do. So uh, we're, we're quite happy actually with the, the, the winter package as it is now and the, the part I'm uh, reporting on. Uh, but what we also can see is that we're uh, not very happy with uh, the, the ambitions that the European Commission is uh, laying down in this new directive. The uh, ambition is uh, now uh, aimed at some 30%, uh, so that's lower than the, in the, the Paris agreements uh, we made, which uh, is 40%. Uh, the European Parliament also said we should uh, try and aim for 40% in energy uh, efficiency. Uh, I think also the, the, the local and regional authorities would support this position. So we would really like the uh, European Commission to be uh, uh, more ambitious in uh, what it's trying to achieve for energy, energy efficiency. Uh, and I very much support uh, the, the point uh, Ms. Egger was making for uh, the positive narrative. Uh, when we look at energy efficiency, it looks like something, well, which is nice to have to a lot of people, but actually it means you're wasting energy. And uh, energy is now, of course, very important from both a geopolitical point of view. We are dependent on the countries surrounding Europe. Uh, but it's also very important from a climate change point of view, of course. So it's very important to the future of, uh, of us, of, of Europe, of our children, uh, to uh, really improve uh, our uh, effectiveness and uh, how we uh, deal with energy. And uh, we would really like the European Commission to be more uh, ambitious. So we would like to uh, have the, uh, the numbers go up to 40% uh, instead of 30%. We'd like not to have, but just uh, 1.5 percent per year, but 2 percent per year. And uh, as we can see in the numbers that Ms. Egger presented, is uh, that only one country thinks it will make this 1.5 uh, percent. Uh, but I believe it was my own country if I noticed correctly. So that's that's nice, but it means that all the other countries think they're not going even uh, to achieve the 1.5 percent. And if we want to reach the Paris objectives really need to go up to 2%. So we would uh, like not just the European uh, Commission to be more uh, ambitious, but also the member states to be more effective in achieving their objectives. So uh, yeah, uh, I think that's uh, the main point uh, I would like to ma uh, make at this, uh, this point. Where, uh, when we look at the package, uh, there's a lot of more uh, details in there. For instance, uh, the one I think it's a uh, it's a bit of out of character with the, the rest of the, uh, the of the winter package. It's that uh, we want uh, the European Commission wants every company with over ten parking spaces to make at least one uh, with uh, a connection for uh, electric vehicles, which of course is very good to uh, promote the use of electric vehicles. Uh, and, uh, but we also would like then uh, the European Commission to uh, make up its mind about uh, one system of connection, so we can have uh, one system of, uh, of connections for electric vehicles across Europe, which is not the case at, uh, at the moment. But uh, we feel it might also be uh, the next uh, curved banana of the, you know, the European Commission. Not in all countries, it's a very, uh, the, uh, the, the, the uptake of electric vehicles is make progress a lot. So we, we feel that might be in some regions that the, the electric vehicle might be years away before there's some prominence on the streets, but already people have to, uh, to are obliged by Brussels, so to speak, to uh, install all these places where they can uh, connect some electric vehicles, which might not come for years. So this is also a question of subsidiarity. But uh, we feel it's very good that we can see that on all levels, from this very practical level to the level of, um, of ambitions that the European Commission is uh, trying to really promote energy efficiency, although they might be a little bit more ambitious than they are now. Thank you very much, Mr. Reisberman, for that intervention. Um, and I think that um, introduces us well to our next um, part, the next session within this webinar, where we're going to discuss a little bit more on the details um, around uh, the, the two directives. So I hope our, our speakers are able to 
remain with us um, for this discussion. Um, so uh, again, because we have, um, I'm very pleased that we have such a, a, a large number of people participating. I think we have more than 50 uh, different organizations participating today. Um, as a result, again, um, I just have to remind you that I'm afraid not everyone will have an opportunity to speak. So rather than use the raise your hand facility, um, if you could write into the chat then everybody can see that and the discussion can continue in written form at the same time as, as we talk here um, in, in the, uh, on the speaker's panel. So I hope that's okay with you and we'll start now to talk a little bit about the details. Do please write in if you have uh, points, comments you want to make to Mr. Reisperman and, and, and questions as we go along. Um, if you don't get an immediate answer, we, we at least are noting what you are saying and, and during the period of the discussion, um, we'll be able to take that on board and come back to you. Okay, so I'm going to use now um, Federen's initial response um, to the two directives, um, Energy Performance and Energy Efficiency, Energy Performance Building and Energy Efficiency Directive, as a basis to, to provoke the discussion. Um, and I've just taken out some of the main points that we um, have noted. Um, so to begin with, um, I think we can put our slides now. Um, I have some slides for this. If uh, hopefully that will come up as I'm as I'm talking. Um, so to begin with, um, I'm just going to start with um, some general comments on aspects of the governance and the communication on clean energy for all Europeans, um, aspects which very directly impacted um, on these two directives. Um, obviously, there's, there's a lot of different papers within this wider package, but there's some very specific points that we felt we needed to draw out from the, these two documents. Um, and we've made four um, points with regard to that. One of them is the energy efficiency first principle. Now, this is stated very clearly in the main communication on clean energy for all Europeans as one of the three main goals. Um, however, when you start to look through the detail on the documents, it's not totally convincing that that has carried through consistently. So we'd be interested to, to get other people's response on that. Um, but in particular, the question of energy efficiency being considered before supply and that this principle is consistently applied wherever that is the more cost-effective option. So that was the first point about energy efficiency first. Um, the second point um, is around the setting of the national targets. Um, and the slightly, perhaps you could even describe it as vague, a little bit uncertain process um, to make sure that the national contributions do indeed add up to the EU total contribution. And I think there's a little anxiety, certainly amongst Federen members, as to whether that process was very sure. What happens if they don't add up? And how strong is, is, is the process to make sure that they do? And then the third uh, very general point we wanted to make there was around multi-level governance. Um, there's a number of places in the communications um, where the importance of uh, uh, the engagement of civil society, of industry, etc., um, is noted. However, the governance document itself does not, I believe, mention local or regional government at all. Um, and we think there's a, a lack of connection there, perhaps a lack of uh, a clear carry through. Um, and wanted to make a very strong point about embedding multi-level governance throughout. And then fourth, the fourth general point um, is about participation and that is a similar issue. Um, that there is certainly a, a gesture towards the importance of participation but again perhaps not a consistent carry through and we would like to highlight the difference between participation and consultation. So consultation could be as simple as a, a, a you know a one one option yes or no, and we all know what happens when when that is offered. Um, but a participation 
could be could imply that actually the relevant stakeholders are involved both in development of details of plans and in their delivery. And so it's rather a different question. So another a fourth sort of fundamental point there. I'm looking to see if there are uh, comments from anybody coming back on these general comments. Uh, not yet. Do our members of the panel wish to intervene at all? Yes, Mr. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, as to the general comments uh, you're making, uh, in my own uh, region we uh, are producing a lot of uh, sustainable energy through uh, wind energy mainly. We're aiming to be uh, energy neutral by 2030, so we like to, uh, uh, for every petajoule of energy consumed in my region, we would like to produce the same amount of energy, which is not exactly the same as that there's no energy coming in or going out, but overall, over the course of a year, it should uh, balance out, uh, which I think is a, a nice uh, uh, ambition, but it's also not uh, based on energy efficiency first. We're just producing more energy, which is, uh, on the one hand, a good uh, way of uh, achieving uh, energy neutrality, but we're, uh, if we want to uh, improve the climate or uh, improve the geopolitical situation with energy dependency on countries outside of the European Union. We really need to have the energy efficiency too. And uh, I very much agree with your comments on the multi-level governance. Because multi-level governance, actually I think it's, uh, it means that the, the role of the, the local and regional authorities should be uh, recognized as being very important. 40% uh, of energy used in Europe is used in, in houses. And people who decide whether or not to use this energy are the people who are actually setting the thermostat in their own homes. So this is really the local people uh, uh, doing this. And national governments are uh, usually uh, on a quite a big distance from people who are, uh, who are making this decision on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, whether they turn up the thermostat in their houses or they want to isolate the houses or they want to turn up or down the, uh, the, 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 the air conditioning in their house. Whether you're in the cold or a hot spot, of course. So uh, it's very important to have the, the local and regional authorities who are much more in connection with their inhabitants uh, to get get them involved, to give them a position to really uh, ensure that people are actually changing their houses uh, from uh, something that may uh, be not very energy efficient at all to uh, uh, what we call uh, zero on the meter houses. So, and this is something we as province are doing with our municipalities. And I think this is something a national government cannot do. So we would really want to call on all municipalities and regional governments to take up this, uh, this task of working with their own people, own inhabitants, of making sure the energy efficiency is improved. Thank you very much. That's really helpful. Again, I'm just looking to see if we have any other interventions. I don't think we've got any yet. Uh, I propose that I respond to some of the, the questions that were asked and also to uh, um, offer some additional comments. So I think uh, on the one hand I'm happy to see energy efficiency first, for the first time really stated uh, in a place that at least it will get some attention. Now that, that's I think very good news. Um, what, of course, we need to have is a framework that uh, ensures that we have the economic conditions to deliver on that. Uh, because uh, if, as I said, um, there is no good way to earn money from it, then uh, the businesses will not be able to deliver it. If we cannot reach the homeowners, as Mr. Risperman just says, uh, then they will also not act upon it. So how to make this practical and make it part of everyone's uh, work and life, I think will be the key uh, thing to watch out for when we look at the, the specific new uh, policy instruments. In response to uh, the questions, um, there was a, a comment from Karen, La Karen Lauer, uh, he asked the question whether it would be not more important to make a stronger case for energy efficiency rather than 
uh, increasing the targets, which uh, is likely to arouse more resistance. A, a very good and very hard question to answer. Ideally, I think we would have both. Uh, we will have consistent communication on uh, the benefits of energy efficiency, which is not something we've seen at all, apart from a small circle of experts who tell each other how good energy efficiency is for the economy, for the competitiveness, uh, for people's energy costs, etc. Then uh, there was uh, a question about uh, from Puya Tamani uh, talking about the differences uh, in energy efficiency policies and uh, the climate. Uh, yes, of course, um, the southern European countries have a lower e uh, need when it comes to heating. Uh, but on the other hand, they may in summer months have very higher energy need uh, for keeping their buildings cool. So um, this is the good thing about the nearly zero energy buildings approach, that it is able to incorporate uh, the very different climate, the very different building cultures, the very different styles. Um, this uh, is very well possible and we have very good examples from a number of member states where they show that under very different climates uh, they can achieve uh, nearly zero uh, energy uh, buildings with different technologies. Thank you. Thank you, Christiana. That's very helpful. Um, so that was the, the very general points. And before um, looking at the detail on the Energy Efficiency Directive, um, actually our first comment on the Energy Efficiency Directive was uh, very much endorsing um, what Mr. Reisperman said about the, uh, the, the target. And I think that quite a number of organizations around Europe have uh, feel strongly about this point. Um, going on to uh, detail of Article 7, um, which is one of the uh, aspects which, where there's a lot of attention given, um, and there's a strong focus on, on Article 7, so it's clearly uh, seen as a, a, a key uh, policy measure uh, within uh, to achieve the energy efficiency target. So we looked at this in, in quite a lot of detail, and I expect other people will have um, detailed comments around it. Uh, one of the first things um, that came out very strongly um, was about additionality, and I think there are quite a few concerns um, to make sure that there is genuine additionality in every aspect of Article 7. So, for example, in relation to new buildings, um, that just achieving building codes, of course, must not be counted as additional savings. Um, and secondly, replacement of measures that reach the end of their useful life. This becomes even more relevant as the, um, the phases for, uh, for energy efficiency obligations are extended, which is very welcome. Um, however, some measures will reach the end of their useful life, and it's very important that replacing these measures occurs and that is not counted as new savings. Um, so looking for sort of areas where there's worry about additionality. And in leverage of other sources of finance, a very important thing to do, but again, just great care to avoid uh, double counting. So if other national measures have contributed to um, in blending finance with energy efficiency obligation finance, uh, that, that those uh, savings are not counted twice. So there was a few points there under additionality. And I'm looking again to see, do we have any comments or questions no, around that? Uh, the replacement of measures that reach the end of their useful life, uh, if you replace it with something, something much more energy efficient, isn't this uh, an energy efficiency uh, result? Or why would you not want to count it? Yes, you're right. If it if it becomes more efficient with the replacement of the measure, so I'm not here talking here um, about a technical building system, so not so much a heating system as, uh, for example, uh, insulation. Um, perhaps um, well, it could be a, a, a fossil fuel boiler, for example, could be an example where 
only if you move to an even higher level should it be counted. So, but some insulation measures may also not last beyond the 10, 20 years. Did we have any? Okay. No. Okay. Uh, more on Article 7 then. Oh, um, also the point so, about was raised through. about monitoring. But, uh, David the Gallagher wants to yep. take the floor. David? David? Uh, yes, yes, thank you. Um, okay, thank you. So, um, regarding Article 7, um, I see that you haven't mentioned uh, the issue of transport, which is uh, an exemption still in the Article 7 and is a field actually where a lot of savings would be possible. And I would be interested to know about um, the view also from, from the rapporteur, Mr. Reisperman, on um, whether this exemption should not be um, taken away in order to be more ambitious in terms of energy savings across Europe. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, I should have introduced David Donnery from Energy Cité. Um, I didn't get the question, sorry, I didn't understand. Able to respond Could you to repeat the question, please? Yes, yes. Uh, re regarding Article 7, the, the exemption for, for transport, I mean, it's an exemption that a lot of member states use in order to reduce ambitions of in terms of energy savings. So wouldn't it be more sensible to also advocate for um, uh, getting away this exemption in order to, uh, to encourage more ambitious energy savings and uh, also in order to give a, a stronger role to local and regional authorities? Because they, are, I mean, they have the most competencies in terms of uh, transport policy. Uh, yeah, of course. It's uh, if we exempt the, the, the transportation from the, the, the energy efficiency obligations, then it's uh, much easier to reach the objectives. That's true. But on the other side, if we um, would include them now, it would be uh, it would raise the uh, the what we ask of our member states by a lot and already they're uh, struggling to reach the 1.5 percent and I think that when we raise the energy efficiency obligation as it is to 2 percent per year it's already uh, asking much more than people are doing now so uh, I think it's a very uh, good idea to include also the, uh, the energy efficiency of transportation or energy savings maybe because if we uh, would make energy if we would make transportation uh, not so much energy, uh, more energy efficient, but uh, uh, we will change it in a way that we just need less transportation. Uh, that would also, I think, uh, be a, uh, a good direction to move. Uh, so the whole system as a whole becomes more uh, energy efficient, not mainly a car or a, a truck, for instance. But uh, it would be good to do that, but I think it would be uh, a lot to ask of our member states if we would also uh, add that into uh, Article 7 uh, on top of the uh, raise from 1 to 2, 1.5 to 2 percent we are suggesting in our uh, report from the Committee of the Regions. Thank you. Um, uh, no, thanks. No, David, did a, you want to come was, back and, uh, a clarification, and comment yeah, from, some more? From, from the rapporteur, so it's, no, it's clear to me now. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, David. Excellent. Um, another point that was raised around um, Article 7 um, is the question of um, actual savings. Um, we understand that um, the savings that are usually reported um, under the energy efficiency obligation are based on what you call deemed savings, so there are estimates um, based on sort of standardized uh, potential savings of different measures. Um, and there's some concern over a longer period of time um, that there could be a, a significant divergence um, because of what we call the performance gap between uh, designed and actual. That it could be to do with the way things are installed. It could be uh, inaccuracies in modeling, um, but also the potential rebound effect, um, which is when people's behavior changes to perhaps be less energy efficient behavior. Um, to some extent after improvement measures. 
So there was a concern around um, monitoring over the longer term that the savings really are, given the, the urgency around climate change, given that, that these savings really are occurring, um, and that, that that kind of monitoring needs to be built in somewhere to make sure that it's happening. Does anybody want to comment on that? I'm looking to see if we have any written comments. No? Shall I move on with that one? Um, another, another point within um, Article 7 is around energy poverty, and, and we were pleased to see um, that the, what was previously an option of including social requirements targeting households affected by energy poverty has been changed to a requirement to do so um, when looking at alternative measures to Article 7, um, but feeling perhaps that's not really clear enough. Um, and that actually something more specific and quantifiable um, would be worth considering. And there is, there is now a new um, fuel poverty observatory being established. So um, the learning around uh, quantifying fuel poverty, energy poverty, I'm sorry, I'm using um, different terms, uh, around quantifying energy poverty and being aware of um, within a population and within a housing stock of the, de the extent of energy poverty, that that knowledge is becoming more widespread. Um, and so there should be some kind of assessment of the proportion of consumers considered to be at risk and tailoring of, of measures towards that if we really want to tackle the problem. Anybody want to comment on this? Oh, we just have a question about the seminar. Yes, we will make the slides um, available. James? Uh, we feel that energy poverty is a very big issue we, uh, we are addressing uh, in this package. So we feel it's also very important to give it more attention than it already receives, I guess. Um, what we will be suggesting in our report, and I hope the Committee of the Regions will uh, support this uh, as a whole, um, is that we uh, can use cohesion policy money to improve housing, uh, housing stock. So we can uh, really invest in the quality of housing uh, to uh, make them more energy efficient. Uh, this will, uh, on the one hand, help us uh, fight energy poverty, and on the other hand, um, we all know that if we invest in uh, the renovation of houses, it will also supply more jobs. It will help local economy. So this is... Um, but, uh, even more than a double-edged sword, we would like to use the uh, cohesion policy money to really invest in this so we can really affect the quality of people's lives in places where they're affected by energy poverty. Thank you. So uh, one more uh, comment uh, on energy efficiency directive that we wanted to raise. Um, was on Article 5, um, although no changes were proposed for this article, um, I think a number of people have pointed out that uh, the requirement for renovation of public buildings, it would make sense to move this to the EPBD um, along with the renovation strategies which have been moved, um, which all makes sense in terms of streamlining and integrating approach. Um, but also that perhaps it should be extended. At the moment, it's only for public buildings which are owned or occupied by central government, by national governments. Um, and actually, there's a view that perhaps we should move on. There's, we need to move on stage by stage. And this could be a time to move on to cover all public buildings. Um, but with awareness that certainly at local and regional level, there will be anxieties around the cost of that. So. Uh, we need plans for supporting finance to enable that to happen. And the other concern that, of course, is raised um, is around historic buildings and the particular sensitivities and complexities of treating historic buildings. That is already there, that there is an exemption where that is too complex. Um, however, there are also very good examples where historic buildings have been treated well to make them more energy efficient. Um, I know of some fantastic examples, actually, um, in in the UK. I'm sorry to, to mention that country. Um, 
but uh, the, the, Nas the National Trust, who own the old buildings there, have found some good ways to to um, to make it buildings more and energy efficient. And I think there's fantastic examples in many countries. Um, so the public buildings is about perhaps moving forward step by step with that. Would we have a? I very ready? much agree that we should also include uh, public buildings from uh, local and regional authorities. But maybe we should uh, couple it with. Uh, the, the energy efficiency audits we might do at those buildings, because many of these uh, measures that you might take are economically feasible. So if you take uh, economically feasible uh, measures, then we, there's not much need for this supporting finance. Because, well, maybe in the short term, because you, might, you need capital, of course, to be able to invest, but uh, in the long term, you might um, win it back. So uh, if we can do something on a, on a capital way, uh, Supplying capital to local, local regional authorities to be able to invest and improve their their buildings in the long run, it will uh, improve, I think, financially as well. And uh, there's also a very important message that local and regional authorities in that way might be uh, sending to their own inhabitants that they really take energy renovation seriously. Because if we ask this from our inhabitants, we should also give the good example. Thank you. Yes, the, the role model is a very, very important aspect of that. Thank you very much. Uh, so that was the main points that came out of the energy efficiency directive changes for us. Um, was there anything further um, the panel would like to say about that before we move on to the energy performance of buildings directive? Uh, we have one comment from the addressing energy poverty. This could have a double benefit. People who suffer energy poverty often live in particularly energy efficient buildings. In other words, the energy benefit on investing in their buildings could be higher and the social improvement. That was from Carl Lauer. Thank you. That's a very important comment. I think at least uh, Mr. Mr. Carl Lauer and I are in agreement on this point. Uh, energy efficiency good. directive. Well, should we go on? Okay. Fantastic. Great. Okay, we'll go on to the looking at um, the main things um, that have arisen from the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive. Um, and one of the very big uh, changes, of course, is the movement of the national long-term renovation strategies from the EED Article 4 to EPBD Article 2A and some significant changes within it at the same time. Uh, certainly, the, this shift seems a very sensible one. Um, and the in introducing a roadmap with clear milestones, introducing mechanisms to guide investment decisions and support development of funding programs. These are all very, very positive changes um, and really clarify the way forward. Um, uh, FEDERN members had some suggestions um, about some additional points. Um, certainly that the phrase, the decarbonization of the building stock needs better definition. Um, and there was a little bit of a concern about the 10-year targets, um, being uh, perhaps a little bit pessimistic that you could have a situation where all the activity is pushed towards the end of the 10 years um, and that perhaps some more interim uh, reporting, um, particularly to own citizens, I think, so that member states are really accountable to their own citizens and engaging with the industry and citizens and, of course, as we mentioned, um, local and regional government, rather than only reporting to the Commission after 10 years, that this is a far more integrated, ongoing process. Um, and perhaps looking at the, um, the national energy and climate plans um, have, a, have a shorter interim reporting phase, just to make sure that the renovation strategies are also reported on. Um, within those phases and not just left to the end of the 10 years and are updated when necessary. Um, so those are the important things there. But one of the points that also came out very strongly from um, some of our uh, members who particularly in countries where heating, fossil fuel heating is still predominant, very predominant and a very big energy user, is a concern that we should be moving towards specifying 
that the reintroduction of fossil fuel based heating systems post major renovation is really a last resort that should not be happening at all unless there really was no other option um, and that that should start to come in as a fundamental principle um, and of course that no new building should be containing fossil fuel based heating systems um, so again that's something that certainly uh, in Ireland and in the UK we still see happening um, and I think believe that it does happen in other countries too so a couple of points there um, have we a response from anybody on that no comments at the uh, moment quite happy but I think that uh, if we have um, 10 year targets uh, I think it's also uh, already um, uh, as a regional administrator I, I feel the uh, 10 year period is actually quite suitable to the speed uh, a government is moving so uh, uh, not as uh, that I'm happy with uh, the speed government is moving in, in any case sometimes we would like to be faster but the 10 year uh, targets are something we can work with very well I think it's more important to have them uh, maybe more binding of the, or to have more measures to make sure that the government is uh, sticking to the 10-year targets than to just have more targets. But it's a, maybe a bit the same discussion as we had before with the 1% the or 1.5% or the 2%. Uh, we can raise targets, but if we don't do anything else, then people might just go as slow as they are. So uh, we, I don't think need, uh, we need more targets, but we need targets that are more binding or with stricter measures if you don't uh, reach them. Uh, maybe I can come. Yeah. Thank you. Can yes, that's a very good. Uh, Someone is typing. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, I think uh, again, building renovation is ideal to show that. This is difficult. I mean, renovating your building stock, the, the public building, the private sector, the business building, this is not an easy task. But as in our society, uh, the way we are organized, if we think this is really useful, then we will do it. And then uh, we will find the finance, we will have to find the structures to organize ourselves. And uh, coming back to these multiple benefits, again, for renovating our buildings, this is especially speaking about the regional buildings, and I uh, work for a region where we have started this a long time ago, uh, is uh, because we see the benefits. We see the benefits that if we uh, renovate our buildings, we decrease our operating costs, we improve the quality of the workplace, of our uh, people who work for the public sector, So, and we decarbonize uh, and we reach energy efficiency targets. Uh, so, um, I think for the building renovation, especially in the public sector, the, the, the potential benefits are quite easy to say, to see, and relatively easy to quantify. The big barrier in the past, as already was discussed, was how to get access to the capital costs. Uh, and I think there are many very good initiatives uh, available uh, from the European Commission. Uh, for example, to support energy performance contracting, so a contractually based uh, financing where a specialized company invests or finances or operates the building. So there is a whole variety of instruments available, which people will actually make use uh, if they see uh, and understand the benefits. So I think the, uh, personally, I would say if we don't get the energy performance of our public buildings right in Europe, uh, as Mr. Westerman was just saying, then there's no way we can ask anyone else in Europe uh, to do so. And there are, again, many, many excellent examples from many countries, many regions, many cities that have done this, and not only countries, cities, and regions that are very rich, they can pay this just out of their ongoing costs, but countries and regions that did have difficulties finding the capital costs. Uh, so I think part of the implementation should be that we keep on stressing uh, the mutual learning and the benefiting 
uh, from other people's positive experiences. Thank you, Christiana. That was useful. Yep. And in relation to that, um, certainly uh, in terms of the providing the capital finance, um, one of the points um, that came out in our discussions previously was about making sure that um, there is regional and local funding programs um, as well as at national level because it tends to be the level at which uh, you can integrate more closely with uh, housing strategy, with economic development uh, policy, etc. and whether building stock is really well known. Of course, every country is different um, in terms of the size and, and the demography as well. But we felt that without regional and local programs, that the national platform, which is envisaged, would, would not be sufficient. I don't know if there's a... Yeah, we have a lot of diversity across uh, Europe, of course, we need to work with. So this, it's, um, I think it's uh, in the execution of any policy, we need to really uh, address this, and especially, especially on, in this one, because there's a vast uh, array of challenges across Europe. I see on the screen that Carol Lauer is making another point about the, uh, the installation of fossil fuel heating systems. If we want to uh, get rid of it. I had a discussion with a politician in my provincial parliament recently uh, who said that we should change everything to district heating because then we are not burning any fossil fuels anymore uh, in, the, in the homes of our cities. Uh, but uh, I asked him how he wants to make the heat from the district, district heating. Uh, and apparently he did realize that if you do that, then you need to get the heat from someplace. And then the centralized heaters are still burning fossil fuel. So we should really try to uh, avoid that we're just shifting the, the use of fossil fuel from a decentralized to a centralized place where we are, for instance, making uh, electricity. We use the electricity to heat the, the homes. We should really uh, see that we replace fossil fuels with sustainable uh, uh, energy sources instead of just uh, moving the, the place where we burn them. Absolutely. Yes, that's a useful point that comes from Mr. Lauer there, and that you do need um, backup provision um, in, in many cases as well. Yeah, I, I think the point there is that techni technically speaking, there is not no single uh, one fixed solution that actually w whatever the, and the discussion, discussions around biomass, I think, are a case in point as well, that you need to look at how sustainable each solution is, whether it's or a, or a local source. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you to Mr. Lauer as well for mm -hmm. the intervention there. Um, we had another couple of points on renovation strategies we wanted to raise as well. Um, the, uh, th there's a huge miss missed opportunity um, in general repair um, maintenance and improvement works on buildings which are carried on all the time every day and is a massive, massive industry in every country and is largely done by very localized um, small built contractors um, and when each one of those interventions offer an opportunity for energy efficiency improvements um, it's a difficult one for policy because it's at the opposite end of the scale it's the very tiny level but these are the things that are happening all the time and it's an industry which uh, survives um, not because of uh, government intervention, but really because of, of consumer demand, um, where they must make repairs on their buildings, or they, they must, or they wish to have improvements in their buildings. Um, and so we would like to see the inclusion of uh, energy improvements um, creep into every um, activity on repair and renovation, rather than focusing only on the very major and there's been also discussion about what is major as well. So we went from looking for the definition of major renovation to thinking actually what you want is to be including this in every activity. And link to that is to make sure that the skills and the knowledge are integrated into the absolutely fundamental mainstream training for all building trades and professionals so that that knowledge is there and is consistent. This is a long-term process, of course. Um, 
but it comes in from policy and it moves through the industry. So this is a, a, a practical point that we wanted to make here. The response, we have more typing happening. Um, Excellent. Exactly the point I tried to make earlier, that we really need to involve local and regional authorities because they are the ones in contact with their inhabitants and their member states, uh, governments are much further away from everyday life. So uh, this is where we in indeed need to uh, involve those local and regional authorities. I'm sorry, my microphone was not on. Thank you. Um, I read out there the question uh, from Mr. Lauer was who should finance the renovation work, which often has very long payback periods. Um, yeah, it, it's it's a a difficult one because the point about um, integrating these improvements into everyday building work is that you make those costs relatively marginal rather than treating it as a single uh, a single measure carried out on its own. Of course, there is still a cost, but if, for example, you were renovating the surface of a of a wall, which is one of the biggest areas of of heat loss in a building. Um, if you were including thermal insulation at the same time, um, the cost of carrying out that insulation is hugely reduced compared to treating the wall as an energy efficiency um, project on its own. Um, so that, that's a standard example, if you like. Um, but of course, the cost is, is an issue. Uh, certainly, um, the more it's done, the more the costs come down. But it's, it's a it's a, a significant problem there. And that's why very often uh, smaller building companies find it difficult to promote these measures because they're afraid they lose the work um, because they've added cost. But if policy requires... I can comment on that. Well, um, as long as I uh, don't think you're saying things I can't else agree can't, with. I'm putting too much... <laughs> I'll let you talk. Uh, but, uh, okay. I would, yeah, would really like to uh, say something about this point because it's very important to discuss mm -hmm. about... Uh, uh, how we finance, and, uh, because there is a lot of benefit, and often the benefit is uh, higher than the cost. Um, and of course, we have very long payback times, but we um, also see that the people who are making the investments are not always the people who are uh, getting the benefits. Yeah. Now, of course, when you're a homeowner, you're making the investment and you're paying the electricity bill. So you're uh, on both sides of the equation. But if you um, uh, have uh, homes which are uh, corporation owned or there's this uh, public housing, then uh, the, the renovation costs are carried by somebody else and the, the, the people who are paying the energy bill. And we need to uh, find some way to bring these two together to make um, the good uh, economic, sound economic cases uh, to finance this. Because I think if you're, uh, as a matter of principle, if we're uh, investing in things that are actually making money, then we should not just uh, supply subsidies or grants. We can also think there should some some way of the money be uh, revolving, so to speak. So we should um, we don't need to have to everything just as, as grants and uh, pay for people to have their homes uh, renovated. Uh, but we should really see who is uh, making the investments and who should who is reaping the benefits of the lower energy bill. We should try to bring those two together. Thank you. That's a really important point about the, f the money revolving and going. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, I think uh, sometimes uh, it is important, especially in the case of building renovation, uh, to uh, look at a little bit more closely at the different markets and at the different buildings. Clearly, there are many buildings where renovation has very long payback periods, but on the other hand, there are also many buildings where you have very economic savings potentials. So um, both in the public and in the private sector. So what policy needs to ensure is a systematic 
approach to this. So how uh, the policy framework that dynamizes a building market where it is economically attractive and not um, a negative issue, as you just mentioned, Catherine, if an, uh, a builder or an, a, a small business proposes an energy efficiency improvement. Uh, these schemes are there and they are very good examples uh, of how to address this. This could be uh, systems where you get certificates, this could be systems where uh, you get dedicated loans, this can be systems where um, there are other kind of uh, economic benefits for those who do it that ensure that the market is systematically ad addressed. Otherwise, this whole building renovation remains an ad hoc thing. So if there's a little program here, some buildings are renovated, but most are not talked about. So I think what uh, the uh, EPBB will need to ensure even more than its uh, predecessor policies is this systematic uh, addressing of um, energy efficiency potential. We have now energy certification of uh, buildings in all member states with all the uh, disadvantages some of these systems have. Nevertheless, uh, now after more than 10 years of introducing them, it gives us a very good picture of the energy performance of different buildings and different market segments. So. Let's start with all the buildings where renovation is already uh, economically possible, possible today, given the payback times. Um, address, as Mr. Risperman said, uh, the owner-tenant issue that um, in some cases uh, the, the owner would need to invest where the tenant pays the ongoing energy bill. The good news is that 70% of all people in Europe live in their own homes. Uh, on, the, on the average, this is not the case, of course, in some countries where you have more renters and in other countries where you have even more owners. So I, I think uh, the, what the new policy needs to do is provide a framework that this is done in a systematic way that fits to specific countries and uh, specific regions. Thank you. That's that's really helpful, Christiana. A very systematic approach to make sure that we um, are actually uh, finding a solution for for every aspect of the building stock um, and owner occupiers as well as uh, landlords and tenants. And we have a comment from De Lauer here. Um, would it not be an idea to focus any public funding on the thermal insulation part of renovations, as other aspects? done in a reasonably profitable manner. Uh, I think that's a, a, a good practical comment. Um, uh, that's often the case, if yes. If I could and particularly just, uh, certain add aspects a point of the thermal on, on insulation. On Some things are much easier than others, um, aren't they? There was mentioned regarding the revolving so, uh, instruments. I think that's a very good point because, um, I mean, since the public budgets are quite strained at the moment, it uh, would be good to have um, from the European Commission especially more support for the use of financial instruments in local and regional authorities to um, yeah, to finance a building renovation stock. And uh, I was wondering actually about the, the Smart Finance for Smart Buildings initiative, if you see this as a potential venue through, the, through which the, um, the use of innovative financial instruments could be encouraged within local and regional authorities. Um, yes, I mean the, the, the smart buildings finance is certainly um, the intention is to to make um, European funds uh, much more practically um, accessible on a national level and to uh, match and merge with uh, national support. Um, and, and certainly our comment around that was that the national platforms are extremely important, but it does need to come down to the to the regional level as well. Um, maybe this is assumed. Well, actually, we feel the same way as you. Uh, 
as you put here, the smartest uh, indicator is, uh, it's actually quite vague what it is, and it's uh, also uh, the link between the smartness of a building and the energy efficiency of the same building is uh, also not very much defined. So uh, we're not too happy with the smartness indicator position in the, the, the EPUDB. Thank you. And I know, um, uh, David, I think you, you, um, your point about um, the lack of reference to transportation issues, this is the only point, uh, Article 8 of Technical Building Systems, where there is some reference at all to uh, mobility issues. Um, and certainly, while it's good to see that begin to be introduced, it's, it does seem almost a little random. Um, <laughs> that the, it's not yeah, a very yeah, comprehensive it's, view, so we... we, it's, we um, it seems a bit random, but um, because it just focuses on cars, actually, and it doesn't focus on also uh, facilitating charging for bicycles, for instance. So it's, um, it's rather going towards one sort of mobility, but it doesn't leave that much flexibility to, um, to local authorities. So this is a point certainly that could be that could be adjusted and um, be making more flexible and also more in line with um, with local planning that is going away from from car use in in certain districts. I mean, new districts that are being built, for instance, in uh, in German cities are are trying to get the car outside outside of the neighborhood. So then introducing electric charging points is kind of a counterproductive, let's say, to to this undertaking. Yes, thank you. I think that illustrates the point very well. Um, there was one other article where the the changes appeared relatively small, but um, there are some potential concerns around the implications. Um, Article 14 and 15, where the requirement for boiler and air conditioning inspections um, has been changed, and the um, the minimum size of um, installation raised, and we had a little bit of a concern around the loss of trigger points, really. Um, for any kind of action on this, all the smaller systems. Um, and what the thinking was around there, it, it, it's, it's almost just thrown in, I'm sure for practical reasons, but there may be some unintended consequences. So because the inspection uh, approach it obviously offers a trigger point, a, a connection for um, noticing efficiency of systems and for bringing in other energy efficiency activity. I don't know if we have any comment on that from anybody. So that was Article 14 and 15 on heating and air conditioning inspections. Any response on that? If not, there was one, there was one more article which was not opened, um, but which we felt should be. <laughs> which is Article 20. And this was our f the final point from Federen's point of view that, that came out. Um, it's almost sometimes feels like an afterthought, Article 20. Um, and certainly uh, regions and energy agencies um, w close to the citizens are very active in, in energy advisory provision and in uh, the activity of explaining and interpreting policy and supporting citizens and uh, businesses in making energy improvements. And I think this is sometimes ignored and overlooked, the, the importance of this. Um, we felt that, uh, as it stands, um, it's, it's rather vague. There's no differentiation made between information, which is, uh, implies something very generalized, um, and advice, which is more of a two-way dialogue and tailored to the specific situation or specific uh, consumer. Um, and 
information in general is only referred to within these two directives um, almost as an extra, um, as an alternative measure under Article 7 of the Energy Efficiency Directive in, in relatively vague terms together with training um, in Energy Efficiency Directive Article 17. And then in this directive, in this article, Article 20, right at the end of EPBD, just, it just says information. So we, f we think that this is an opportunity for Article 20 to be more detailed, more specific, and really map out the support that consumers need, particularly for deep renovation of buildings. Um, and that the question of trigger points here is, is huge. So trigger points could be everything from a change of occupant, a change of owner, um, a need for a building re repair or renovation, or what we call a distress purchase when a heating system breaks down. All of these can be trigger points. Um, and all of those uh, are an opportunity for an intervention. But the support needs to achieve deep renovation are really quite considerable. So our, our recommendation there was that a, a much more specific and detailed um, article uh, be developed. Uh, uh, looking well, to see for our it opinion, we feel it's important to have, uh, we have experience with this in the, the Netherlands, to have uh, obligatory uh, energy audits for companies. Uh, um, in the Netherlands, it's done also obligatory to uh, implement any measures that are coming out of the energy audits with a return period of shorter than five years. When we first started these energy audits in the Netherlands, uh, companies were quite cross. They had this extra obligation that they could do without. But nowadays they're quite happy with it because actually it's, uh, they're earning money. So these uh, obligatory energy audits for companies are, uh, are working. I'm not quite sure if it would work for uh, the uh, for private people, but for, for companies it works. Uh, maybe I can comment on that, uh, on the energy advice. My organization is providing about 10,000 face-to-face energy advice sessions to homeowners every year. Uh, so we help them especially uh, in the course of their renovation or also when they're in the process of constructing a new home. And it's very evident that this is one uh, from uh, many different evaluations we have done over time, that this is as important uh, for actually energy efficiency investment happening than it is uh, to make appropriate financing uh, mechanisms available. So uh, uh, the recommendations are fully supported. So not only information, which you have to seek out uh, actively, uh, where the homeowner has to seek for it, is offer energy advice that proactively approaches his homeowners and supports them with uh, situation-specific information. So in my region, for example, any homeowner can call us and we come for free in their home. Uh, for one and a half hours and support them with uh, technical questions, but of course also helping them in getting access to the different funding programs. And this is a comparatively small program uh, in terms of overall costs, but it, which is very effective uh, from a policy uh, perspective. Thank you, Christiana. That's a really useful example from Upper Austria from your, your real experience of, of providing advisory programs. Um, we have one comment uh, actually in relation to our previous uh, topic um, from Fanny Rato of EHI. We believe replacing existing old stock of heaters is important as thermal insulation for improving the energy efficiency of buildings. So that was in relation to the previous comment from uh, Karl Lauer um, about uh, making a priority on thermal insulation. So we have both are important, of course. Um, and we've come to the end of uh, the topics we wanted to um, provoke discussion around. Um, so I would like to ask the panel if there's any further or final comments you'd like to make before we conclude. 
you have any wrap up? I, I, I can hide while well, you're thinking about that if you like. I, there are a few things that came up for me. Um, there was the binding targets um, and an important ambition that they were really crucial, that public buildings are role models, um, the importance of long term reliable policy. Um, that advice is as important as, as finance, but the, that the financial provision is, must be systematic for. Uh, I feel that the, uh, the, the the attention to the positive narrative we need is very important. So it's good we discussed that today. So I'd like to stress that again, uh, together of course with the higher ambitions we all need to attack this. I think uh, global issue we need to, uh, to work on. Absolutely, thank you. That probably most important comment of all about the positive narrative. And I mustn't forget before, because Diana, I'll give you an opportunity in a moment. But um, we had one more written comment. Although energy consumption is more relevant during building operation, does the EU envision any strategy to address the energy performance of buildings from a whole life cycle approach to encourage energy reduction from material production as well as the end of life phase? So we have a very big question just as we're concluding the discussion. I'm not sure if we can very, very important intervention. Sorry, uh, I hope now you can hear me. Um, so one short comment on uh, Pedro's uh, question. Member states can do that already if they want. They can incorporate um, uh, the, energy, the so-called grey energy into their cancellation methods. However, uh, a small word of warning, um, the, it increases the complexity a lot. So uh, it, it's very important to look at uh, this very carefully in order not to deter people uh, from renovating and from taking energy efficiency measures. Well, uh, I uh, would like to um, agree with the final statement that it is important that uh, we bring uh, the regional and the local labor level to the table in this dis discussion. We have a lot to contribute to uh, uh, creating man and maintaining and sustaining energy efficiency markets. We are close to our citizens and the SMEs in our companies, and we can also uh, create the right narrative, the right motivation for political decision makers, for homeowners, for businesses, for the municipalities to go forward and making energy efficiency the first fuel. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you, Katrina. I can agree with, with all the, the final statements that have been made and would also like to stress that especially now, um, in this period, the local and regional authorities um, we have to be more vocal on the European level because what I see in the discussions from the, from the Council of Ministers is that there is a lot of attempt to water down the energy efficiency directive and uh, all the energy efficiency proposals, so it's really crucial for us to yeah, raise this positive narrative and uh, advocate for more ambitious policies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Really good point on which to, to finish. So I'd like to